This is chapter 5 of the book of Daniel, and we begin with the text, beginning at verse 1. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver, which Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, be brought that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden and silver vessels which had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand, and the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The king cried aloud to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king said to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple, and have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing, or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet hall, and the queen said, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you, or your color change. There is in your kingdom a man in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit of knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple, and have a chain of gold about your neck, and shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God, gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty, and because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would slew, he slewed, and whom he would keep alive, he kept alive. Whom he would raise up, and whom he would put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened, so that he dealt proudly, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among men, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of men and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, 
which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed, many, many, tekel, and parson. This is interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered your days, the days of your kingdom, and brought it to an end. Teko, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar commanded, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put about his neck, and proclamation was made concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about sixty-two years old. Chapter 5 occurs about thirty years after the events in chapter 4, so that Nebuchadnezzar has died, and Nabonidus is king, and his son Belshazzar is co-reigning. As chapter 5 begins, we see Belshazzar reveling in a drunken feast. The word drank in verse 1 is a participle in the Aramaic and therefore has the sense of continuous drinking, that is, inebriation. According to the scholars, the banquets at this time in Babylon also include debauchery, sexual license, and idolatry. To make matters worse, Belshazzar commits sacrilege against Yahweh by drinking from the sacred vessels taken from the temple in Jerusalem and using them to praise his pagan gods. In the book of Ezra, chapter 1, we are told that there were 5,400 such items stored in the temple treasury. So we see a complete moral breakdown in the beginning of this chapter, a discarding of all restraints and accepted norms and Belshazzar invites a thousand of his lords to participate in this sin. And this is why, that very night he is going to be judged by God, put to death, and his kingdom conquered. What is really going on here, and what can we learn? From the opening chapter, God is pursuing Nebuchadnezzar, trying to win his heart, because God wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And Nebuchadnezzar, being a powerful king ruling over a vast empire, would have great influence for good or evil. So God troubles his conscience through dreams and sends Daniel to give the proper interpretation, and also saves Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the blazing furnace, allowing Nebuchadnezzar to actually see an angel walking with them in the midst of the fire, and Nebuchadnezzar begins to respond. By the end of chapters 2 and 3, Nebuchadnezzar is praising the God of Israel and, at the opening of chapter 4, joyfully testifies to all peoples, languages, and nations God's greatness, especially for giving him back his sanity. What we do not know is how deeply Nebuchadnezzar is converted, or whether it lasts, whether he learned, for example, from the Torah, or put into practice any of the wisdom of Israel. After all, Daniel was with him for many years as one of his advisors. If he did learn whether he passed the wisdom to his successors, did Nebuchadnezzar have his children instructed in God's law? After reading chapter 5, it appears either that he did not or that Belshazzar was not interested in learning. But we do know this, both Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar were created in God's image and likeness to know God and to serve Him in this life and enjoy His presence forever in the next. Part of this dignity of being created in God's image and likeness is a deep hunger for true happiness, that is, for God. As St. Augustine said in his Confessions, quote, God created us for Himself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in Him. End of quote. God gave both of these leaders the opportunity to begin to satisfy this deep hunger by entering into a relationship with him, aided by Daniel and his friends. God gives that opportunity also to us 
at the most fundamental level, the question is, how does this work? How did it work for Daniel? As children growing up in Jerusalem, Daniel and his friends would have been taught the Torah, God's revelation given to Moses on Mount Sinai. They would have been trained daily in this knowledge by their parents and formed by a community of faith. How did this help? What does knowing really involve? Here I will give a brief explanation of the traditional Catholic understanding of knowledge, that is, epistemology in the realist sense, and one that is very important for us in our own spiritual lives. In the Catholic tradition, and this goes way back and actually picks up some insights from Aristotle, and then through the Church Fathers and Doctors up through the Scholastics, the teaching is that when we know something, the presence of the known comes into us. That is, the immaterial form of the known unites with our immaterial intellect. So, for example, when we hear a piece of music, it enters through our hearing and has its effect as we know it. If the music is good, that is, a certain fullness or perfection according to its nature, then it lifts us up. There is not just the knowing, but along with the knowing, a certain appetizing or desiring of what is known. Furthermore, the perfection of that music enters us and communicates or adds its being to our nature. We are now more substantial, more fullness of being. This happens as regards music at a pretty simple, minimal level. But what if we were to actually know God through prayer, scripture, and the teachings of the church, the catechism? God is the fullness of being, the highest good. And when he enters us, there is union, union of mind and heart, and we are made more substantial with his being. There is a communication of act, God's presence in us, and we are made more real, more weighty in terms of his glory. Furthermore, the known always shapes us to it. There is a conformation of the knower to the known, so that we become more godlike, partakers of the divine nature, as St. Peter says in his second letter. And this can extend not only to taking on his nature, but our being a cause of that nature, a cause of God to others. So I will give you the typical example or analogy that many of the church fathers used in their teaching these principles. It's a very classic example about this communication of act from one nature to another. The analogy they used was a rod of iron placed in a very hot fire, like a blacksmith would do in shaping metal, say making a horseshoe. So you put a rod of iron, at least one end of it, in a blazing furnace, and what happens? The iron begins to take on the very nature of the fire. It becomes hot with the fire's heat. It becomes bright with the fire's very light. If you leave it in long enough, the iron actually moves like the fire, becoming flexible, malleable. Eventually, there comes a point where you can't really tell where the fire ends and the iron begins. They become so identical. Finally, the iron takes on the fire nature so much that it becomes actually a cause of fire itself, so that if you take the iron out of the fire and touch a piece of paper with that iron, the paper burst into flames. In other words, the fire nature has come into the iron and united itself with it so much that the iron now communicates the fire to others. Well, as it was in the physical world, so it can be in our spiritual life. As we are in God's presence through the sacraments of the church, in prayer, meditation, reading scripture, doing the works of charity, then we are like the iron in the fire. We take on God's nature. 
And this is what's called divinization. Again, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, we become partakers of the divine nature. There is a biblical example of this process with Moses in the book of Exodus chapter 34. After spending 40 days in God's presence on Mount Sinai, Moses' face begins to shine with the very light of God, like the iron in the fire. At the Basilica of St. Peter in Chains, there is a magnificent sculpture of Moses by Michelangelo. The muscular figure of a seated Moses is depicted with horns. Art historians note that Moses is depicted with horns due to the closeness of the Hebrew word for beams of light and horns. St. Paul also takes up this theme in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 by applying it to the Holy Spirit, quote, And we all with unveiled faces Beholding the glory of the Lord are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. End of quote. The same word for being changed in this verse is used to describe what happened to Jesus' human nature at the Mount of Transfiguration. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 12, St. Cyril of Jerusalem adds the important point that freedom from sin heightens our ability to enter into this divinization. In his Jerusalem Catechesis, he exhorts, quote, May purity of conscience remove the veil from your soul, so that by contemplating the glory of the Lord, as in a mirror, you may be transformed from glory to glory in Christ Jesus our Lord. End of quote. Now, getting back to the iron in the fire, it's not as if the iron loses its nature as it takes on the fire. Rather, it becomes more truly iron. The fire enacts certain latent potentialities in the iron. The iron's ability to be hot, bright, and movable, and a cause of fire to another. So it is with us. When we know God and partake His nature, we become more fully human more fully alive. And as St. Irenaeus said, quote, the glory of God is a person fully alive, end of quote. And this would include the joy of making God known, of being a cause of God to others. Blaise Pascal adds to this by stating, quote, God instituted prayer in order to give his creatures the dignity of causality, end of quote. And that's from his famous Pensees. This point of not losing one's nature in the process of divinization was emphasized in the Vatican II document Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 22, quote, The truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. For Adam, the first man, was a figure of him who was to come, namely Jesus Christ the Lord. Christ, the final Adam, by the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to man himself and makes his supreme calling clear. End of quote. So the point is that there is a communication of presence in the act of knowing. With knowledge comes desire, especially when we are knowing the thing in its goodness. So this desire, or another way of putting it, the act of the will follows upon the presence of the known and its goodness in us the knower, so that the knower is drawn toward the known in its fullness. So when the infinite goodness, that is God, enters us through prayer and scripture, church teaching, etc., our will is inflamed, our desire grows for more, and we are drawn into the one we love through our knowing him. And the more we know, the more we are drawn in, and the more our desire grows. As Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 12, quote, To him who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. End of quote. Our desire follows continuously upon our knowing constantly, so that the more we know God, who is the fullness of perfection and of being, 
and goodness, the greater the desire in us. And that's why it is so important to be discerning as to what we allow into our minds and souls, because knowing can also deform us if it is disordered or sinful, such as gratuitous violence or pornography. This is why St. Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verse 8, quote, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, end of quote. And that is why prayer is so important to Daniel and his friends. They desired to know God more fully, and they wanted the presence of his majesty in them to know God as fully as possible, which is why they ordered their lives and actions to attain this end. Now back to chapter 5. What was Belshazzar doing at this drinking party? He was seeking happiness, certainly in a limited, dysfunctional way. But was he actually taking steps to know the God of Israel? Did he even bother to learn about Daniel's presence in his kingdom? It appears not because in chapter 5, verse 10, the queen has to be brought in to inform Belshazzar of the presence of Daniel, this wise man, who his father knew. So rather than learn who the God of Israel was and call upon Daniel to teach him the ways of God and desire a relationship with God and increase his joy, Belshazzar dissipates his life in debauchery, trying to find happiness in finite goods like power, pleasure, esteem, which are partial and fleeting. So just as knowledge of God increases love and one's being and character or essence, sin dissipates or empties out one's being. One is led from being toward nothingness. That was actually the case for Nebuchadnezzar because he descended from a rational man to living like a subrational beast. And that's why when Daniel gives the interpretation of the writing on the wall, he says to Belshazzar, quote, You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting, end of quote. In other words, having dissipated his life in sin, he was rendered insubstantial, a lightweight, and therefore very unstable and fearful, easily shaken, whereas Daniel and his friends, although captive, were truly free, courageous, strong, and influential, weighty, because they had the very being of God in them through their knowing God, loving God, and obeying Him. The lesson for us in this chapter is to take every step possible to know God and order everything in our lives toward this one end, this God who is the sunum bonum, the highest, fullest good, when known by us, increases our desire in order to know him even more, because since we are created beings, that knowledge and desire will increase and never be exhausted. We will go from glory to glory eternally. In heaven, the vision of God is called beatific because as we grow in our knowledge and union with God, we take on more and more of his nature and are made beautiful. And another word for beautiful is blessed or happy. That is why in the Gospel of John chapter 3, we have that amazing few verses which basically brings out this point, quote, How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. End of quote. Notice what is being said here by the beloved apostle. Quote, when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, or as he be, that is, 
at the second coming of Christ and on into eternity, when we are in the beatific vision, we are gazing on the Blessed Trinity. And as we take in that vision, that knowledge, there is again a union between us, the knower, and God, the known. And we are continually and eternally conformed to the Trinity. And we are going to be knowing him in a very special way, because as St. Thomas Aquinas teaches, we will be given a very special grace called the light of glory, which will heighten our intellect so that the knowing will be perfected. That is, we will see God as he is without any intermediary. God will join us directly to himself without any defect. As the psalmist says, quote, In your light we see light. End of quote. So whereas now in this earthly existence we see in a glass darkly, to quote St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but then face to face. In that conformation, in that knowledge, in the union, we become more like God. And as we do, then our will is inflamed and opens up, desiring to know even more of God, which of course God being infinite will give to us, which then inflames our desire again, which will open us up even more to desire him. And God will fill that with his being, and it will be an exponential knowing and loving eternally forever. We will be in a continuous divinization, and our joy will be ecstatic. And the wonderful news is that this begins now. Heaven is not something we have to wait for because God has given us this desire as a result of our being created in his image and likeness. And this desire is already the beginning of union. If we act on that desire and not allow it to be stifled by many partial, inferior, created goods like money, pleasure, power, esteem, as Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar did. But when we purify our mind and allow our desire to be enacted by taking steps to know God, then in all of these steps, starting now, to get to the goal of union with God, there is joy, even if along the way we have to face sacrifices and sufferings and losses, joy remains. Now we will look at a few more of the highlights of this chapter 5. In verse 1, King Belshazzar holds a great feast for a thousand of his lords, where there is a great amount of drinking. In a way, it was similar to what King Xerxes did in his kingdom of Persia at the opening of the book of Esther. He holds a huge banquet and shows off the riches and splendor of his kingdom. Both of these feasts share something in common. They end up in great disaster for each of the kings and for their kingdom. The reason Xerxes held his feast was to make plans to go to war against Greece, and he was trying to instill confidence in his officials and all the wealth and power that he wielded so that they would join him in this great campaign to extend his kingdom. But he was soundly defeated by Greece and had to retreat in shame. In Daniel chapter 5, King Belshazzar's feast also has devastating consequences as we have seen. Scholars believe that Belshazzar had this banquet because, once again, he wanted to instill confidence in his people and his officials because the armies of Persia were camped outside the walls of Babylon. He wanted to assure his subjects that the gods of Babylon were powerful and that they would protect the kingdom, which is why he drinks wine and praises the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. But he was deposed that very night and his kingdom given to Darius the Mede. In contrast to this, we have another feast that is held at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In John chapter 2, Jesus attends a wedding feast where the wine runs out, and he performs his first miracle as the long-awaited Messiah by changing not just a little bit of water into wine, but actually 180 gallons of water into the very best of wine. He did this to announce the beginning of his ministry and the establishment of his kingdom, 
which would offer salvation to the entire world. In the Old Testament, especially in the prophetic books, one of the signs of the coming Messiah would be the inauguration of the great messianic feast. For example, in Isaiah chapter 25, starting at verse 6, we read, quote, On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. End of quote. There are other passages in the Old Testament in which it is stated that at the time of the Messiah there would be an abundance of wine and great joy. So Jesus, at a wedding feast, reveals his identity as the Messiah by providing a superabundance of wine and also identifies himself as the bridegroom who has come to marry his people, thereby fulfilling the many Old Testament passages referring to God as the husband of Israel. And we know Jesus would go on to change wine into his blood at the great feast of the Last Supper, so that throughout all time, he may be distributed to us, his people, in sacred vessels, not just to thousands, but millions, all out of love for us, his bride, so that the great wedding banquet of heaven is ours, where every tear will be wiped away, and death overcome, and joy celebrated forever. Getting back to our text in Daniel chapter 5, verse 5, we see that immediately after Belshazzar has this drunken feast in which he commits sacrilege, it states, quote, The fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, end of quote. And we know that that hand had written before, not on a wall, but on two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, the first of which stated, You shall have no other gods before me. The hand would also write on the ground in John chapter 8, verse 6, as the woman caught in adultery is brought before Jesus. It also reminds us of what the magician said to Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 8, verse 19, when God enacted the plagues. Quote, this is the finger of God, end of quote. King Belshazzar is greatly alarmed and his color changes and his knees knock, and he cries out for someone to interpret the writing. The queen responds in verse 10, and very prudently, because she was not at the banquet, and therefore not intoxicated. She is probably the queen mother, as Belshazzar's wives were all at the feast. So she comes into the banquet hall and informs the king that there is a man in whom the spirit of the holy gods dwell, who possesses light and understanding and wisdom. Daniel is brought in and sees how shaken the great king is. And again, Belshazzar's condition reminds us of how weak and fragile and easily agitated even the great kings and power brokers can be if they have not built their life on God. And so Belshazzar's guilt, having dissipated his life in sin by bringing the sacred vessels into this drunken feast, weighs heavily on his conscience. And here he is, limp, fearful, and terror-stricken. In verse 17, Daniel gives answer to the king, but there is no introduction of respectful words that Daniel would have given. Belshazzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar, he simply tells the king to keep your gifts, give your rewards to another, and then provides the interpretation, which is disastrous for Belshazzar. This refusal to take any of the gifts offered again shows the remarkable detachment in Daniel, similar to when he refused the rich food and wine at the king's table. It shows a consistency of righteousness throughout Daniel's period of exile. Then Daniel gives Belshazzar a history lesson regarding his father Nebuchadnezzar, how in his pride he was driven away and his mind made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys, until he knew that the Most High God rules all kingdoms.
So with that background, then in verse 22, Daniel says to Belshazzar, quote, And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, end of quote. In other words, Belshazzar's punishment would be greater than that of Nebuchadnezzar, who, although he was proud, yet in the end repented and glorified God. And so Daniel gives the devastating interpretation of the writing on the wall. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Teko, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And so the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 21 is fulfilled. In verse 5, he states, quote, They set the tables, they spread the rugs. They eat, they drink. Get up, you officers, oil the shields. And verse 9, quote, Look, here comes a man in a chariot with a team of horses, and he gives back the answers. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. All the images of its gods lie shattered on the ground. End of quote.